All right. I would like to now introduce Nathan Smith, um, who is the OER coordinator at Houston Community College, and he's going to tell us about uh, their, their OER degree work there at Houston Community College. Thank you, Nathan. Hello. Thanks, Una. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, glad to see quite a few participants that are on the, the line, so that's really cool. Um, so just going to give you uh, the overview of our OER degree plan, or we, we are calling it the Z degree. Uh, uh, and um, I've got a PowerPoint here, but then I also have my notes from the um, from the questionnaire that that uh, y'all that CCC OER sent out. So I'm I'm gonna be referring that to that too. I might have a couple things to add. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm the OER coordinator. I'm also an instructor of philosophy. Um, I've been in the position of OER coordinator since uh, about uh, summer of last year. So, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second here. Okay, let's see, make sure. All right, so just an overview of HCC. Um, <clears throat> so Houston Community College uh, is accredited as one district or one college even though we have uh, three regions and, and, and 27 campuses. Um, we're a very large urban community college. Um, and so here's some of our demographic information for you. Uh, an extremely diverse population, um, the largest number of uh, international students in um, the United States at a community college. Um, <clears throat> we've, uh, and if you look at the total individuals uh, enrolled in the institution, I don't know if you can see my cursor as I'm waving it around here, but um, that might be useful to you. The total enrollments are close to, uh, total individuals are close to 115,000 individuals in a year. Um, so uh, we, we reach quite a few students in the, mainly the Houston Metro, um, region. Okay. So, uh, as we're, as you look at the OER Z degree, what we're currently offering are um, basically two de different degree plans. Um, we have an Associate of Arts or Associate of Science in what we call multidisciplinary studies. This is basically the Gen Ed transfer degree program, transfer degree. Um, and then we also are offering an Associate of Arts in Business Administration. That is, uh, a, the Business Administration degree is the, um, the largest enrollment degree plan that is not a gen ed degree plan. So it's the largest enrollment specific major. Um, and we are currently offering these courses at, um, three campuses or, you know, depending on how you count it, we have two face-to-face -face campuses, the central, central campus, which is our largest um, enrollment campus, and then Northline campus, uh, where, so we have these, um, what are called uh, centers of excellence, where um, predominantly workforce programs are um, sort of located at a particular, in a particular region, um, and coordinated with industry and there's kind of a focal point on that and we have our business center of excellence excellence at the north line campus so we chose to kind of launch the degrees at our highest enrollment campus and at the campus where uh, we had our center of excellence and then of course we have uh, most of the courses are uh, also offered online Let's see. Oh, and the way we construe, just to, to sort of add a bit to this, the way we construe a Z degree, I know this is a little different for different people, but we uh, try to offer a, um, a structured schedule of classes um, that aligns with the advising plan. So, uh, you know, if we say that students need to take, you know, these five courses in their first semester, then we are offering those five, we're offering a, um, a schedule of classes at a particular um, campus 
where a student could actually take all five classes in that first semester. And then the same thing with the second semester and third semester. And so there's a little bit of coordination that has to occur in terms of sort of lining up the schedule and working with the chairs, department chairs, to make sure that they get, this, they get classes scheduled at times where their instructors can teach, but also so that we're, we don't have like conflicting um, times, you know, so if students need to take English 1301 and they also need to take the student success course, we don't want to offer all the sections of 1301 at the same time that we're offering the student success course. All right, so I've got a timeline here that shows you kind of how we ramped up um, to offering a, a Z degree and it happened very quickly. Um, you know, for many years we had a, a decentralized structure and we had lots of people doing good work in OER, but it was pretty um, loosely connected. Um, we had a new chancellor in, in uh, 2014 who embarked in this, this um, transformation, which basically united all of the academics programs. We used to be, we used to be in separate colleges and, and now we're kind of all together. So we created new departments and there's a lot of shuffling around. Um, that actually enabled us, uh, as far as the Z degree was concerned, to kind of unite some of our efforts. In, the, in 2016, the, um, the provost or uh, chief academic officer, we call them um, the uh, vice chancellor of instruction, um, put together a capstone committee on um, open ed educational resources. And at the same time, we had this student group called the Student Library Advisory Council, or SLAC here. They did a presentation to the Board of Trustees um, on the price of textbooks and the, the need for OER. And that really put you know, the need really in front of the people that matter. And, um, and at the same time, Achieving the Dream was coming out with their uh, grants. And so we put together an application. We didn't get that application, but the whole process really helped us focus our energies. And what happened was in the summer, uh, the Kinder Foundation, which is a local Houston uh, nonprofit that focuses on education and the arts, they approached us and said, we're really interested in this idea of an OER degree and we'd like to support Houston Community College. And we said, well, good news, we've got a plan ready. And basically we shared that with them and they were really impressed with how far along the process we were, how much we thought about it. And so they were willing to, to, to fund us and that really helped out. Um, in fall 2016, we kind of did a lot of the groundwork in terms of getting policy together, working with the Tidewater policy statements to kind of get our definitions right. Um, attended Open Ed 16, which was really helpful, kind of giving us a broad picture of how, how this stuff works. And then in the spring of 2017, we really started rolling it out. That's when we needed to do training, bring faculty on. We received the first installment of our grant funding. Um, and then in the summer, I was hired as a full-time OER coordinator. We began recruiting students um, we also were accepted into the OpenStax Institutional Partnership. So this year we've been institutional partners with OpenStax, which has been really helpful as well. Okay, I'm going to get you, um, and then in fall set 2017, we launched the degree. Um, if you look at the overview of the program here, so fall 2017, we launched, we've got 28 sections, um, 11 of those are online and 17 face-to-face. -face. Um, that netted us 17, 700, a little over 700 duplicated enrollments. Um, and uh, you know that's 12 unique courses and we were doing it online and at central campus. And then in the spring, you know, there are two factors that led to expansion. One was that we increased to another campus. We started offering at that Northline campus. But then also, you know, you roll into the second, we started out with just offering the first semester's classes. And then we, the second, in the spring, we offered the second semester's classes, but we kept some of the first semester's classes. Because once the faculty had developed the classes and they were comfortable with teaching them OER, 
there, we could easily just reschedule those classes. And we also could conceive of it as, you know, if a student missed a class or they needed to make up, or if they were slightly out of sync with the advising plan for whatever reason, the course would still be available. So you can see the jump in the total from, of classes. Um, uh, significantly more online. Of course, it's really easy to offer a class online. Basically, as soon as you've produced the class, you know, any faculty member can just, just offer that same class online. So there was a, it, was an easy, it was easy to jump our number of classes online. Of course, our enrollments uh, grew correspondingly. And, um, and so then we have the three campuses. So when you look at our estimated cost savings to students, um, in the Z degree, we can pin this number down with some accuracy. You know, we're assuming at $100 per student per course. Um, I, I really want to look at that number more closely. I've kind of done some preliminary research, and it, it may be a little high for us, but, but it's, it's not a bad number to start with, and it's a pretty standard one that people use. Um, so, um, but if you use the $100 per student per course as the average textbook cost, um, you know, we can pin down that over this year, just fall and spring, we've saved students close to $200,000. Now, we want to sort of project not only what we're doing in the Z degree, but what all of our professors across the institution are doing with OER. And those may be people that we've trained in the Z degree and, and they're offering OER classes, but we didn't tag them as Z degree because, you know, they're just, they're just other classes the instructor happens to be teaching. They also may be instructors at different campuses that, you know, they just didn't fit in with our plans for the Z degree right away. Or there may be people we really haven't contacted yet. Um, but this is an estimate because we don't have a really great way of tracking the total number of enrollments in OER classes. We're working towards that. But um, we estimate this based on survey data um, and, uh, and, and kind of projecting sort of how many classes instructors teach. So it's a little bit more rough, but if you put the two together, you know, we do suspect that in, in just a year, year's time, we're probably saving close to a million dollars uh, if uh, in textbook costs for students. Um, you know, again, I've, I've got some caveats on those numbers, but I'd be happy to answer questions later. All right, so as we look to expand the program, you got the fall and the spring there. Um, sorry, this looks a little busy, but um, <clears throat> it, as we go forward, the goal, the next stage of our, our development with the Z degree is going to be to um, try to provide a core curriculum zero cost option at every major campus in the um, district. So I mentioned that there were like 27 campuses, but a lot of those campuses are tiny. I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, in the hun uh, hundreds of duplicated enrollments per year. Um, so when I talk about major campuses, you know, we're talking <clears throat> around on the order of 4,500 or 5,000 enrollments per semester. We have nine of those in the district. And so my goal is to get a, at least the core curriculum, at least one or two classes in the core curriculum that we can tag as having zero cost to students, an OER class that has zero cost to students. Um, and we wanna to try to get that at all campuses. So next year, I'm focusing on two of our largest campuses, the Spring Branch campus and the Stafford campus. So after Central, those are our next largest campuses. Um, you know, they're up in the 18, 19,000 student, uh, student enrollments per semester. So it's a, they're, they're big, big classes, big, I mean, big campuses. All right, so that's, so give you ideas sort of what goes on behind the scenes. Our, you know, we, we do have uh, um, some, some key uh, councils and committees that help guide the Z degree. And um, first of all, we have our Instructional Materials Council, which um, governs, you know, all of the uh, uh, textbook adoptions and things like this. And then we also have this OER 
steering committee. And that was kind of an outgrowth of that capstone project that the vice chancellor of instruction uh, initiated in 2016. Um, and the cool thing about this uh, committee is that it really does have a cross-sectional membership. And I'll just kind of read off who is on that committee, but there are uh, administrators, uh, librarians, instructional te uh, technology folks, um, instructional designers, um, and a student representative as well. We have deans, faculty, as well as um, upper level administrators. So it's a very, it's a very nice cross section of people and, and it provides uh, some good feedback. And then fortunately we have a full-time position uh, this is our, our OER coordinator position is a faculty position. So I'm a philosophy faculty member, but I get a full teaching release. So basically I can, I can devote all my time to this. I teach one class online uh, as an overload. So give you a rough budget. Now I'm putting these numbers up here, trying to be just as transparent as possible, but um, I want you, if you're looking at these numbers to just realize that, again, we are an institution of about 115,000 individual students. So, you know, if you're looking at this and, and thinking, you know, how does that compare to my institution, you know, um, just, just try to do a little comparative analysis for yourself. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's going to vary. So, the, one of the biggest expenses we have is faculty stipends. Um, we're, we, we are uh, paying uh, faculty a stipend to develop courses or to adopt an OER course, to change over their course. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that um, in the questions. We're, we're actually doing a little bit, we're changing this number slightly. We're gonna have tiers of uh, course adoption and development, but um, our, in our operational budget, we have a part-time administrative assistant that helps out um, with the uh, with the office uh, management, um, and then basically there's supplies and contractor services, which is really just speaker fees, um, and then a marketing. Um, we we do have an inclusive contract with Lumen Learning um, to provide some of the training initially. Uh, they are no, in the next upcoming year, they're not going to be providing that training in the same way that they did previously, but they are giving us support for the courses. Um, and instead of attaching that to a student fee, we are uh, simply uh, paying a lump sum to them. And these are our sources. So we are providing a fair, uh, at least, you know, more than you know, 150% of the uh, grant foundation monies in, internally. And that's a goal going forward is to um, transition, to shift the cost from the foundation to internally. All right, so I wanted to talk about surprises and challenges, and I feel like I'm coming up on the limit of my time. But um, I'll just uh, go through these sort of kind of quickly. Um, maybe you all can ask questions on this if you have any. Um, so the first one refers to, you know, the issue of, you know, how many instructors and how many students we had. We thought that it would be really hard to find instructors and really easy to find students. And it turned out that it was kind of the opposite. We've got a lot of instructors who want to get involved in the program. Um, and, you know, we've had a real challenge recruiting and registering students. I've got some numbers that I can give you in the Q&A, but it has just been uh, surprising how challenging it is. You know, we can collect student information, find people who fit, but actually getting them registered in the courses has been a huge hurdle. You know, we've got, you know, this the internal stuff of bureaucracy, you know, working on agreements has been really challenging. Uh, one thing is com the communication. You know, you're dealing with chairs, uh, in our case, you know, we have to adopt uh, the materials with a program committee. So you're dealing with the chair of that program committee, dealing with faculty. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, student services, all sorts of different things that come into this. So managing that all is really uh, challenging. Um, okay, I'll come down to the next one. Some things to think about if you're thinking about building a OER degree. 
you know, definitely plan, 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 but then be flexible, be willing to sort of scrap things and, or start, start over, you know, you're going to require people who are going to push this stuff through. Cause a lot of the hurdles that you run into in terms of getting people to adopt an OER or recognizing that this is a worthwhile pursuit um, really is people issues. I mean, it's just talking to people, working through their, their, their challenges, uh, listening to their concerns. Um, so you really need people that, that your faculty and your, your instructional leaders respect that you can talk, to, that you, that can sort of take that forward. Um, oh, this last one I have, I do want to say this. I mean, I, I uh, sometimes envy the, the, the folks who started out just promoting OER and trying to coordinate an OER effort, this sort of horizontal approach. You know, let's get as many classes as we can just to offer OER, figure out who, who we can bring on board, and then later on try to align that into a vertical degree plan. It's really challenging to do those two things at the same time. Um, and so uh, maybe uh, starting out by building a base of OER and then going vertical would help. Although I will say from the point of view of upper level administrators and the board of trustees, the Z degree notion has been galvanizing and has really focused their energy. So I don't know, it's challenging to manage, but uh, maybe it uh, recruits people more quickly. Oh yeah, um, you know, like I said, trying to make it sustainable, um, integrating it with our existing structures. One thing we did do that I hope is gonna be, have a big impact is we are tagging our courses as a zero cost book option and low cost book option in our PeopleSoft uh, student system. That is gonna allow students to search for classes that are tagged this way. And a class can be tagged zero cost book without being a Z degree uh, course, uh, we decided not to try to differentiate those things for students. If an instructor can offer their, their class with zero cost to the students, we want them to highlight that in the system, whether or not we've actually put them in the structured schedule at the campuses that we've designated for the Z degree. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the reach would be just gigantic if we could get the core at all of our major campuses. But that's about it. I want to leave some time for questions. Sorry I went on so long, but um, uh, that's it. How are we doing? Anybody questions? Any questions? I can continue talking. Um, there's some other things that are uh, that may be interesting to you uh, in terms of uh, the um, sort of data we're collecting on this. Um, you know, we we looked at student success rates and and withdrawal rates, and um, we need to go back and see if we can identify drop rates. That's something that we don't collect very easily in our Office of Institutional Research. We do find that the Z degree classes seem to uh, reduce the withdrawal rate a little bit, potentially, but we did not find increases in, in success or <clears throat> rates. In fact, our Z degree classes were lower. Um, you know, I'm not, we have pretty small sample size at this stage, so I'm not willing to draw any kind of conclusions. It's all very preliminary data, but, I thought it, that was interesting. Um, I've done some, some, uh, yep, some, uh, some interviews with faculty and students, and had some interesting success, interesting stories from them. But uh, there are no questions. Una is telling me I need to wrap up, so I will sign off. Thanks for uh, listening. Thanks so much, Nathan, for uh, that interesting overview of um, how Houston Community College got started um, on the OER degree, because it was a little bit different path than uh, some of the others. 
Um, there is a question in the chat window. I'm going to let you answer that in the chat window um, sure. because it is time for us to switch to our next um, session. So thank you so much. And uh, Nathan, it might be helpful for folks who have questions as it come up, if you could put your email address in the chat window as well. Absolutely. And I'll link to uh, the website where I can sh where I share all of this information. Oh, so, wonderful. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to all our participants this morning. We'll be starting our next session in five moments.